welcome. You're listening to Talking About It. It being a massive theatre. Not really sure why I'm whispering. It's not a secret. Uh, I'm Dr. Joanna Bucknell and over the course of this podcast series, I'm going to be heading out to talk to immersive theatre performers, practitioners, makers and producers in their own natural habitats uh, with the hope of gaining some insight into the nature of the work that they do and some of the processes that they have to go through in order to get that work out to you, the general public. Now, first of all, I'm going to try quite hard not to be boring. Not that immersive theatre has really the potential to particularly be boring. Uh, And secondly, I'm going to try really hard not to be too academic about the whole thing, which again is a challenge being that I'm a doctor and also an academic. But we'll see how it goes. So let's get started. Okay, so uh, I'm here at the Albany Theatre in London with Oliver Lansley, the Artistic Director of Le Enfance Terrible, and their producer James Seeger, uh, to discuss their immersive show from last year, Alice's Adventures Underground. Um, So firstly, uh, I wanted to congratulate you on your Olivia Award nomination. Thank you very much. Uh, You must be really stoked to have got that nomination. Has it changed things at all since...? I think for us, kind of just um, to be acknowledged amongst those awards and particularly for an immersive show and the type of show and the type of theatre company that we are um, to be acknowledged on that scale and, and, and amongst those sort of shows was, was quite a big well a, quite a big deal for us but I think quite an important um, mark in, in to, to the way that theatre is going and the way that theatre is changing and to see different types of theatre being acknowledged alongside more traditional forms I, I don't, we, well I, I don't Ollie and I were really expecting it um, because it's a, you know a little bit different from what they recognised before, mm. it was a real shock. So we weren't expecting it. Yeah. Um, and it was yeah, as Ollie said, it lovely to be recognised. Um, yeah, very happy. Yeah, it was very surreal. <laughs> well, once again, congratulations on your Olivier nomination. I'm sure it's going to open up lots more doors and lots more opportunities in the future. Um, can you talk a little bit about? What makes your work so distinct? What do you think makes Léon Font Terrible really recognisable? Well, I guess um, it's sort of story, you know, storytelling. We're a storytelling company. Uh, you know, that, that is always first and foremost, whether we're doing an event or whether we're doing a, a traditional play or whether we're doing a piece of immersive theatre. I think the thing that ties everything that we do together is, is the kind of it, the storytelling element. Um, and then obviously we're known for our kind of visual aesthetic we, we're very theatrical we've got live music and puppets and visuals and you know we embrace the kind of theatricality of what we do mm-hmm. I think um, you know we love the theatre and, and kind of embracing that and I don't think at any point do we pretend in our shows that you know, we kind of smash through the fourth wall quite a lot. We never sort of yeah. deny the fact that we're using stagecraft and, 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 and in a piece of theatre. So, and I, and I think we, we, we try and use music or, or props or puppetry uh, as a mean to tell the story mm-hmm. uh, as opposed to maybe look at us, we're doing this. It has to serve a reason for, for being there mm. um, and a reason for telling the story. And I think hopefully that makes us at least memorable. But well, I think nice audiences to respond that. to that, don't they? Because I think what uh, forms like, for example, naturalism or realism do can be done in other mediums now mm. more effectively. And I think the joy for me, especially I'm a theatre scholar, so what I'm interested in is, is the theatricality, is that being in the same room as those people. And I think your work really acknowledges... Mm. The fact that we're in that space with you and sharing that experience well, I think with that's us. That's a massive thing, particularly at the moment. I think that's you're seeing that across all art forms. In the last few years, everything is becoming, which it wasn't, you know, five or six years ago, but now everything is being pushed towards more experiential stuff, more live performance. You know, you look at, you know, even though, and it's all often it is driven by economy, but the way that music has shifted in the last few years to being about artists making money from doing their live shows, mm-hmm. you know, and those shows then, you know, having to become more theatrical, more, you know, more of an experience and also audiences now are craving different, you know, we, we, there's such a, you know, there's so many 
Netflix and Amazon, you know, there's so much great content that you can get um, at the, you know, at your fingertips the yeah. whole time. So if you're trying to, com if we're trying to compete with that and ask people to pay out 50 quid and leave their sofa and, you know, leave Breaking Bad and come and <laughs> sit in a dark room with us, you've got to, you, you know, you've got to make it something that you can't get elsewhere. But I, I think our artistic policies is, you know, we, as Ollie said before, I think we do what we feel, like, what we want to do. And, and sometimes, you know, I remember driving back from Edinburgh one year, like, what should we do now? What would we want to see? Mm. Yeah. It's never sit down and thinking, uh, let's make this something cool because of this or that. It's like, we've done a musical, let's do, I've always been interested in the First World War, let's do a First World War drama, or or uh, let's do a kids show, or, or let's do an immersive show. It's, it's what we would want to see and what excites us at that particular moment. I would, and I would hope, actually, one of the main threads that I, th I think comes through in our work is our genuine enthusiasm for what we do and our kind of mm. excitement about it. It's very much... We are, we are as excited about anyone about creating these shows, and I think that's what is the key to, to us making you know work that people like is because we like it you know do you think that those core people then you said uh, immaculate was a real kind of turning mm, point yeah. for the company so do you think those core people that you have involved are kind of what drive everything forward from their that collaboration i think first of all they're they're amazing at their jobs mm. yeah. sam wire <laughs> um and, and tom gisby or, or whoever that we've mentioned and uh also we have a an shorthand I guess between us all uh, and we all kind of have a, without realising a similar vision mm -hmm. um, but they're passionate and, and dedicated and very talented but we all get on really really well and share ideas and be in, in a really good collaborative space to create the work It's a real mix because also the company kind of thrives and con and continues to kind of succeed based on collaboration and new people so I think it's very mm -hmm. much a combination of you know, either you're an enfant or you're not. <laughs> you know, you go through, and so along along the years, you sort of pick people up, and once you're in, you're in. I saw Alice Underground last year, um, and I know lots of people probably didn't, and I wanted to ask you a little bit about it, but also what I don't want to do is to uh, give anyone who might be listening spoilers if they're intent, because I know you're bringing it back. It is, it's coming back year. next April. I'm glad you said that, I would have given loads of spoilers. I'm away. so excited, I'm going to go again, because I, the, I actually went twice, but I managed what to have the same route both okay. times. I'm not sure how I managed to do that. So when it comes back again, I'm going to go again. Right. Um, so I wanted to ask you if you could uh, explain a little bit about Alice to the people listening without giving too much away. <laughs> so... <laughs> In a, in a tagline, which sounds really... Uh, we, we never use this tagline, but essentially we... And it sounds a bit corny and cheesy. It's not really Alice's adventure, it's yours. And that's what yeah. we wanted to do. When you read that book, as Ollie said, you, you want to go to Wonderland, and this is your opportunity to go to Wonderland. And from a logistical point of view, 56 people go into Wonderland, and you get a choice of eat me, drink me, and that splits you up into two routes, uh, 28 and 28, and then those 28, as they go off, do different routes, get split up again. So there are four groups of 14 that go around Wonderland and have a unique experience. Well, essentially, everyone is given a playing card. Everyone is, yeah. is yeah. assigned a playing That's card. That's why it's and your 28. journey is dictated by whichever card you might get. Yes, I think I still have mine in my purse. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I love getting can... stuff when I come away from a show. I yeah. like mm -hmm. having things to keep, so I really like the card as well. And you can... There are lots of different variations of, of what you can experience from that show. And, you know, like, so did you go, were you red or black card? Red. I remember, red. Both times. <laughs> so you got to see uh, the Mock Tower show. Yes, I did. And that actually was my probably my favourite moment in the show. I just, I absolutely loved it. Yeah, I it was that beautiful. was a very good one. Mm -hmm. Really beautiful. <laughs> but also what we wanted to do, the reason why we wanted to do a show like this, two reasons. One, as I said... Uh, we felt it was the best way to tell that story when you read Alice uh, you want to go to that world um, but, but two and I can't remember what my number two was your number two is basically what you're saying is, is the, re the reason why we ventured into kind of doing immersive yeah, theatre is that we, we um, you know massive fans there's some brilliant companies out there doing it and um, you know massive fans of what they do but what we wanted to do was something that we hadn't encountered before which was being able to go into a really immersive world that is totally sort of three-dimensional, 
but still feel really integrated into a into a full narrative and to really feel yeah. part of that. And so the big thing with Alice was the huge kind of logistical challenges to go, right, how do you bring, how do you create a world and how do you create a, an audience experience where you get freedom of choice and also the ability to kind of explore and, um, you know, ha have a sense of kind of freedom, but at the same time, curate their experience and give them a story because yeah. you know the, the very nature of a story is you need to be able to progress it you need a beginning and middle and an end and yeah. how do you do that without controlling your audience so the logistics that went into the show was so complicated and, and that's why we ended up having the, the cards and so you've got a level of kind of um, being able to not control but kind of curate a, an audience member's journey through the space and so you know, from an audience member, it's uh, the different audience goes in every 15 minutes and they go on this route. But then there's also a whole other rotor in the background. And so you've got 40 different actors. But, mm -hmm. you know, the complications of if you want to progress a story, for example, you might want to see a character at the beginning of the show and at the middle of the show and the end of the show. But because they're working on this loop, you've got actors that are performing... Like the tea party is a good example. You've got the, the hatters that are performing their tea party... Um, for 10 minutes and then the moment that scene finishes they have to rush across to the court to appear at the end of someone else's yeah. show so the, <laughs> it was incredibly complicated but Alice and James suggested as well yeah, that that's it's in some ways we get kind of our experience as we go through it but then of course the actors are effectively doing a durational yeah yeah. piece yep. of work so yeah. in a way their experience is really different as well to what the audience the actors yeah totally yeah. and because of that the actors all play up to six parts each. Wow. So so even if you went on, yeah, you could see that, like, it's an impossible show to note as a director because you would note a show and you would go, right, well, that combination of actors is not going to happen again for another two months. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's you can see the show, you can see exactly the same route two nights in a row and you'd see a totally different thing. Mm -hmm. You could see it on the same night, you know, the Mock Turtle that you've seen, which yeah. is, you know, this big kind of musical set piece. For the first six shows, you might see someone playing that on a guitar, and the next six shows, you might see someone playing it on a dunk piano somewhere else. And yeah. So it's you know it was, but again, I think all of that kind of anarchy added to the sense of it being you know that's what Wonderland is. It's a real world that is mm -hmm. moving and shifting and changing, and mm -hmm. you know, you walk out one you know door and suddenly you see all these other people rushing this way and that way, and you know I think that's what was the the biggest challenge but also the biggest kind of achievement with that show was having that full world moving about and, and bringing it back we're really excited about being able to push that even further you know I think we were surprised and impressed with how much the audience engaged with our process and were you know we, we, we realised a lot and you realise a lot that in immersive theatre it's not just about what you see it's also about what you don't see yeah. and it's about the, the audience's level of how, how prepared they are to interact and I think when we bring it back we're, we can be even bolder with mm -hmm. with those choices and, and, and the different routes um, mm. I yeah. enjoyed the opportunity as well to spy on the group that were eating the tarts <laughs> yes. yeah. as well so I really enjoyed kind of peeking in on those and um, it, rem it was similar I've been to uh, third Rail Project's mm. uh, piece about Alice. Uh, then she fell in New York yes. as well. And there was a similar moment in there where I got to kind of spy on other people yeah. having their experience through kind of a mirror. Yeah. And I thought that was really interesting because there were two really different takes on kind of actually the same yeah, yeah, text, yeah. which I thought was really interesting. Um, so there's also a draw, isn't there, for the audience to keep coming back as well because yeah. there's that possibility that it's just different every single time. Mm -hmm. I mean, originally when we started it, the, the, the four routes were, you know, everyone saw the same thing. But then we realised and saw, you know, in, in the bar afterwards, people really, as Ollie said, enjoyed seeing different things and talking about mm -hmm. experiencing different things. So we made the yeah, routes I mean, very different. Big, big, big change in the first few yeah. days and the first, you know, week, week or so of the show. It totally changing it and realising, yeah, like you say, the part of, part of the joy of this show was you'd have two people... That you know, or four people that went in together, they'd all choo choose, make different choices, and then they come back at the end going, What? Well, I didn't see that, and you saw that, and what you know, saw a caterpillar, and this, that, and the other. So, you know, and then that became part of the experience, mm. I think. And it, it formed, as, as we said, it makes it like a, a real world, 
You know, that mm. there are other, th- you're aware that other things are going on yeah. over there. I mean, what we need to do is, is make your journey as fulfilling as possible, but realize that someone else is sort of living mm. and, yeah. and that's exciting. And, and obviously, people want to come back and, and experience that as yeah. well. Well, it extends the interest. And I'm really interested in audience experience and trying to capture audience experience and trying to understand audience mm. experience. So, actually, I've found that with nearly all the immersive stuff I've gone to, some of the most the way you kind of extend your experience is then in the bar afterwards when mm. you've all had completely mm. different experiences and you can get the chance to kind of, oh, I didn't see that, or share these different kind of moments. Yeah. And like, oh, God, I want to come back now because I want to see that, but then I might not see that. And <laughs> so there's this whole thing that kind of actually extends yeah. that experience beyond... Well, it was also, for us, a big moments. thing was to go, how do you give everyone a different but an equal experience yeah. we didn't want people to be like oh well I missed that and I'm you know and I I, I did I went through the wrong door and I didn't go to see the right person <laughs> and so again it's about trying to make sure that everyone gets feels like they're part of their own narrative and, mm-hmm. and an important part of that um, in some ways it's a big risk of it isn't it because it's so close to so many people's hearts and it's so beloved mm. that kind of that text for children and for adults across many generations so was there a kind of um, an anxiety about sort of taking that text yeah uh, there's, there's definitely anxiety for me about the Mad Hatter I think you know and, and the tea party because I think the minute you know even with the posters looking at you the minute you put the Mad Hatter on there it's like People think that Alice in Wonderland, he, that character is so iconic, even maybe more so than Alice. Oh, like, yeah. like, how are they going to do their hatter? How are they going to do the tea party? There is an expectation. You've got to play to that, uh, that expectation a little bit, but at the same time, you have to offer something your own. We talked about it. it a lot, didn't we? Yeah. And it, it's particularly with something as iconic as this, and it's been done so many times. Mm. You're fighting, you're towing a real, you really have to toe a line between giving doing something of your own but also satisfying what the audience's needs from that piece yeah. with if you if you go if you go to wonderland you need x y and z from that but you don't want to you know and, and also you have an opinion most people with with alice it's one of those shows that actually everyone has a totally different version and it's a hybrid of Tim Burton, Disney, a cartoon, a book they read, you know, it's, it, you know, an, an adaptation, or, or it's something from Looking Glass, or it's you know being told the story. It's everyone had thinks they know Alice in Wonderland, but what most people know is is, is this kind of mishmash of references and cultural references, and yeah. you know, it, 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 it's across everything. So you're trying to satisfy a very wide ranging kind of, <laughs> but it's instinctual. But it's in people's psyche Alice in Wonderland so yeah it's very much that balance between satisfying people's desires for it but making your own decisions and mm-hmm. you know uh, and creating your own world and I think as long as you see that through t- to a certain level of detail hopefully usually you'll you'll be okay with it and you don't just make decisions for the sake of making decisions like going right our mad hat is not going to have a hat because <laughs> no one's done that before um, you know as long as you make your decisions based on your own internal logic of what the piece is. I think yeah. that's a good a mm. rule in general. And, and on that, it's, it, it, that lead, does lead on to where we first started because I was quite keen for it to, to not reinvent the wheel and not have yeah. an Alice in Wonderland set in an office or something because I felt <laughs> that people have done that a lot. And for me personally, haven't seen uh, an, an experience in the immersive world where, where you go to Wonderland that's in my mind, but it does come back to what Ollie's saying is and what is in your mind. But when we first started talking about it with Sam, uh, his idea of, of Alice, and from a design point of view, was this dystopian world that had gone to ruin, mm-hmm. uh, that had been left for over 150 years, and, and, it, and it almost like uh, you know, no, no one had gone there anymore. And, and um, it was a really good starting point. I remember at the time thinking, oh, I think we're going a bit too far that way. But then, you know, we met, I think, in a nice hybrid but in, in our the middle story a little bit. Came but from, from that. Also, really it all comes from the text. Everything in that show comes from somewhere in the text. It's not just us kind of going off-piste. And <laughs> no. No, but it fit with our logic, as, as mm. what Ollie was saying, in mm. terms of, okay, the, and we started making decisions about, okay, if our Wonderland was set... Well, the big thing that, that we did was take, was take out Alice from Alice in Wonderland, because yeah. we realised very early on that 
whenever you've got Alice there, she becomes this kind of conduit that you experience everything through. And and, yeah. and when you want your audience to experience that, you are Alice. You need you? to yeah. you need to take that filter Alice. away to allow them to experience it directly. Mm. Um, but that was a big day, wasn't it? <laughs> Doing this, you know. The, the, but whenever anything happens and you're seeing it through her eyes, you you know, there's a distance created. So mm. it was it was taking her out. That was a big thing and then we were like well where's she gone why is she not there and blah 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 blah. Mm. and then it all started kind of coming together through that and I think our role was very clear which I think is quite nice because with lots of other immersive things I've been to in a way you have to kind of be an immersive experienced person to be able to negotiate those worlds and actually I thought this sort of really bridged that gap and was really accessible in terms of that we had a fairly clear role that took us around and then sort of inducted us into mm. that space which I thought then gave us a bit more freedom to be able to experience Oh good, things. well I think that's such an important thing mm. in, a, in, a, in a piece of immersive theatre. If you're going to put if you're going to be in a world if you're going to put an audience in a world the most important thing for that audience member is to know who they are in that world because then they can then they can play by the rules of it. If you're yeah. if you're in a in a world and characters start talking to you, you need to know who you are. Are you an audience member? Are you a voyeur? Are you a you know someone within that world? So I think and it's very similar. We talk a lot about we you know we talked a lot about computer games and the mm-hmm. computer game kind of model of when you start playing a computer game these days, you have a tutorial and you of choose course. your character and you you know and and you learn about the world so that. And then it gets more. Well, there's a mechanic, isn't there? And you learn the mechanic before you can then engage with that. And I think I I make uh, immersive, well, from a live art, more of a live art perspective. So stuff that engages an audience. I think it's weird to call it immersive potentially, but I guess Mm. it would be lumped in with that. And the one thing I found is throughout all my PhD researches, the less kind of freedom and the more clear the mechanic Mm. of the liminal space was, actually, the more freedom people felt they had and the better they could engage with whatever Mm. was going on. So I think what you do at the beginning of the show is really set that up so that the audience can kind of go, okay, so these are the rules, this is kind of... And you'd be amazed at how people, people that would... You know, we're people who make an immersive theatre that on the whole probably wouldn't claim to be immersive theatre fans in the sense that we would be terrified. You know, whenever we go to immersive theatre, we're like, oh, God, please don't talk to me, don't make me do anything. But the thing is, I think, you know, very quickly, as long as you establish those rules, people that wouldn't consider themselves to be immersive theatre fans, people that wouldn't even dream about talking to an actor or this, that, and that, if the rules are clear, very quickly they find themselves in a comfortable position and they go much further than they thought they would. And that's sort of what I was alluding to earlier in terms of what we do when we come back, is realising that, you know, for a, not just for a kind of, you know, Shoreditch immersive, we, we do an immersive theatre show every day, you know, we had a very wide range of audience on Alice and the kind of, you know, we had a lot of what you would consider to be traditional West End type audience. Yeah, I was surprised when I was waiting, I really enjoyed the theatrical space that we got to wait in as well, I thought that mm. was really lovely, but the diversity of the audience that were there really struck me, because other things I've been at hasn't been... It, we, we were very surprised by that, and, and and you know probably one of the things that, that we're the most proud proud of actually with the show is the diversity of that audience. Is you know again you know got nominated for an Olivia, you're tapping into that audience, but then also you're tapping into our more traditional audience. Yeah. But you had all these people that were willing to go with it, to go with the show, and by the end when you've got the kind of final set piece in the court everyone's involved and everyone gets yeah. involved and I think you know that's something that we're really excited to kind of keep pushing and exploring mm-hmm. and, but it's so much about like you say it's about establishing that mechanic well as soon as you take their hand and pull them across the space that they normally just watch you have to give them something yeah. a reason to invest but also a, a, a way to navigate something that's unknown I think you manage that on two levels because Alice is so known so there's that a level of comfort that comes with okay well I, I know these characters in some form or another and I know this world in some form or another even if it's kind of a bricolage of mm. all of those cultural representations of that text but that gives you a comfort and then when you're put into suits I think that really mm. uh, consolidates that's so your kind of like okay I know what I'm doing now and I feel comfortable and I feel like I can play mm. now that I've got the rules of the, the game well actually the core the, again, the, well, the first show the, in the court, not everyone did stuff. And actually, I remember we got notes from a friend of ours who's an actress, and she was in one of the groups, and they got up and they did their bit. And then her 
boyfriend who's not an actor. And, you know, he, he was like, well, I was sitting there and I was jealous and I wanted to do something. <laughs> I wanted to be a part of it. And again, that really surprised us because we, we, we were like, oh, can we maybe get these people to do this? And, and actually, immediately, it was like, no, we're, we're invested in it. We've been on this journey and we want to be a part of it. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, we started pushing it further and further, you know. And those first, that first week, the show changed so unrecognisably <laughs> every every day <coughs> yeah. because you because the thing about and we knew and we knew this to be the case but it's it was totally a show that until you put an audience through it you don't know what it is That's you don't know how it's yeah. going to work and you have to be able to adapt absolutely with everything that you and know. also we without being you know granose about it, it it no one had done anything like this before really mm-hmm. in, in terms of the, the mathematical complexity of yes. it as well and no one had done it on this scale so we were learning as we, as we were doing um, and we had to adapt which was slightly terrifying at times mm. and changing it especially for the actors but. I think for this form it's one of the biggest issues and it's one of the things I have a lot in my own work as well and I was going to ask actually lead very well into my next question um, it's so hard to kind of rehearse this sort of work yeah. because it's so reliant upon that mm. participation from the audience and so I was going to ask you, kind of, what strategies did you try well, and do? As well, you we went did. Through? I mean, it, the, we did have to um, rehearse, and, and and you're right as well. But the, yeah, the rehearsal process of this was as complicated as the show, <laughs> as Ollie said earlier. That you know, we had 42 actors, but then you know, each just, actor's rehearsing six parts with six different things. You know, so you're kind of. It, I mean, it was absolutely nuts. It was, and but we had to be methodical with our planning of rehearsal. We sat down and spent probably three solid days maybe more of actually right at 10 o'clock 12 o'clock we'll do this scene at the same time someone else is looking at that scene then we have to move over to another scene and do that how many times are we looking at that scene we've only looked at it four times we've got to look at it five times with this combination it was and then we need to leave them there and they need to rotate cast and they need to rotate cast every 20 minutes while we're leaving them there and we're going to go and touch on this and then we're going to do this <laughs> I can't it was, it was believe ridiculous. we did that <laughs> but it had to be had to be done <clears throat> yeah. like that uh, so that when we got into the space, that side of it, the mathematical methodicalness of it uh, was there and then we could, uh, putting an audience in, be flexible to change things as we had well, to. there's different levels of, you know, it's the, uh, old, the old, is it Rumsfeld quote, that you've got your known knowns, you've got your unknown knowns and you've got your unknown <laughs> unknowns. So therefore, you have to make sure, you, you, have, to, you have to go through every single kind of, you, everything that you can think of because you know that you're going to get to a point where there's stuff that you haven't thought of so you need to have done mm. every eventuality that, that is on the cards and you need to know you go right we don't know how this one's going to work but we know we're going to have to deal with it yeah. I mean we're, we're, we're working on a new show at the, at the moment which is going to be opening in July which is another an, another immersive piece and with that it's even again we're pushing the kind of the, the, the audience interaction even further and that is literally we have no idea if it is going to work until we put an audience in and we're doing a kind of rough R&D next week but it's literally you know the, it's very much audience driven and we don't know if, if, it all, if it's going to last an hour or ten minutes or two hours yeah. because <laughs> it's all being judged by you know driven by the audience so it's, it's kind of terrifying but it's exciting because yeah. you're doing stuff that you know, we certainly haven't attempted before, you know, so it's, yeah. Did you have, um, and I always have this too, I try and think of everything anyone could possibly do within the space that you've created, but there's always someone who does something that you could never possibly have anticipated. So did you have strategies for kind of errant audience? Well, I, I, I never anticipated an audience to get into the water during the mock turtle scene, so it, it, <laughs> yeah, that, that was something that. that I never thought would happen you, and deal with. Wow. So uh, yeah. you can't prepare for that. What you do is you get, you, you know, it's, it's very much... Should you give them a towel? Or that someone would try and snog our rabbit. So uh, wow, there you okay. go. I mean, we had all... <laughs> All sorts going yeah, on. You can't. But the, what you do is you get really, really good performers, and you and you get them battle ready, and you kind of throw everything at them. And our cast were unbelievable yeah. because the stuff that they had to, you know, on press night of all nights, we had a power cut and everything went down. So suddenly they found themselves in a, you know, in a eight foot square room. You know, with Lynn Gardner <laughs> uh. <laughs> trying to occupy her for twenty minutes while you know, while no one knew. You know, it was just. Oh, but you, you, 
that is all about the, the personnel and people yeah. sink or swim and we were very lucky to, to, to work with a bunch of people. We did everything we could to prepare them for that but it's yeah. again you're preparing people for the unpreparable for. <laughs> well this is a difficulty and um, I've just started teaching it to undergraduates as well as a unit in massive theatre and one of the things that really struck me is there's no real kind of training <laughs> no. that you can kind of engage in as a performer mm. to sort of deal with this and when I make my own work as well I'm kind of like how do you audition someone when <clears throat> you want them to do real things in a real space with real people so it's, it's really about it comes down to kind of their mm. their charisma, their kind of bravery. Well, we started doing almost like at the beginning of our immersive project. We almost do like an immersive boot camp. Yeah. We start. <laughs> yes. But I think it's important as well to remember that with this, um, you know, there's a there's a big script. Ollie mm. and Anthony wrote, uh, you know, a very very detailed script. And what was also was was hard for us as as directors and, and probably for Ollie and Anthony as writers is thinking because the scenes had to last. For example, one scene had to last seven minutes. Not seven minutes and one second, seven minutes. It wow. had to uh, because of the complexities and the mathematical of all these people coming through. Yeah. So that was really tough in rehearsals of, of get, of, and also being cutting, cutting stuff and cutting mm. the script. But then if your scene that you've got written down as an actor finished in six minutes, then you've got to improvise for the next minute because the audience aren't allowed to leave that room uh, before. Yeah. They, they cannot. But also, it will, the big it will thing mess is, everything up. is with, with audience. You know, and I remember having this conversation with actors <laughs> is going trusting your muscle memory you 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 it, the idea of going i'm going to do this monologue and it's going to last six minutes and 37 seconds you say that to an actor and they're like that's impossible i can't do that every night but then i know we've done 15 years at the Edinburgh festival and you have an hour you have an hour yeah. to get in and out and, and you do a whole play and you you know you time that and that play it usually is within a minute of itself. Mm. And it, it's not like you're doing everything exactly at the same time, but you, you by the end of that run, you're consistent to about a minute or two. Yeah. So six minutes is a doddle. <laughs> but, you, but the thing is, it's trusting that, and it's trusting your memory. And, 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 and by the end, the actors would be doing scenes, and it would be bang. You know, and, you, and, and we'd put these sound cues in, mm. in, the, in, the, in, the, um, in the soundtrack, and you would see them. You'd go and you'd watch them, and they'd talk, and they'd finish the speech, and the moment they finished, the sound cue came up. Because it, it's amazing what your internal clock can do, and what you you know yeah. when you, when you when you know what you're doing. Mm. But it's having faith in it, and that yeah. is the biggest thing. That's the biggest challenge for an actor, particularly on a show like this, is having faith in everything. Because you have to trust everything else about the world. Mm. Because you can't control a show like mm. this. And, and all, we tried. We did, yeah. <laughs> but all, all these things, you know, in terms of actors sharing roles or, or scenes lasting for that amount of seconds. It wasn't us trying to be clever. That, that It had to be done that way. That was the hard way. We'd like to have done it the easy way, but it had to be that way. I mean, the, the actors, you know, there's a scene, the, the kitchen scene, they, they do the same scene on repeat 36 times a night. Wow. Uh, the two actors. So it's one audience leaves, another audience comes in straight away, and you do that 36 times. So from that, you, you can't have those two actors doing that for six months. So that was one of the reasons why then the following night, those two actors did another role. Uh. Um, so that was, you know, the reason. And then, so within the 42 actors that were involved, they were all in teams of six, four or five or six. And within those six, uh, those six actors shared a different role on rotation each night. And as I said earlier, you know, that combination was, was you know, different for, for us and for audiences that saw it. It would always be different. But that, that was because otherwise they'd go mad. <laughs> Not in a good way. Yeah, no, of um, course. <laughs> and the timing thing is, is because 56 people go in every 15 minutes. Yeah. So you can't have you know, an audience hanging around in one area a bit longer than they wanted to. So we built into lighting effects, sound effects, different effects, so the actor would know in the scene, OK, they've got to go one, yeah. one thing goes awry in the whole dominoes you know you're you know you've got more you know it's like a you know it's a it's a tube and you get one blockage and you've you know the, the I, audience members are coming up I, I think you. something I mean maybe I've known this for a long time but this show more than anything I think I, I've realized about myself and, and I'll probably always the same is that we are control freaks really and this is the ultimate show where we have no <laughs> control because you press the button and the show went. At yeah. six o'clock, you press a button and you, nothing you can do about it. Just it. Yeah. And that's terrifying. And that's going until, for, until for it a, stops. Yeah, and that's wow. terrifying for as a director, but it's probably terrifying for Ollie and I who are both 
kind of a little bit control freaks because you know control over it. It just happens. <laughs> and you can try, you know, like trying to note a performance. You can go through, you know, the difference between watching someone in their first show and their twelfth show. It, it, they, night, it's a yeah. different performance, you know, let alone between the first night, and the second night, and the third night. So mm. yeah, as as a director, it Did was. Do you have any issues difficult. with? And I know lots of other shows have uh, talked about this that people taking things yeah. that they shouldn't take. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> constantly replay, having to replace. I mean, Sam has designed such a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful world that mm. I'm not. Yeah, yeah. So people unfortunately wanted to. But we were talking about this world. earlier. Like people, people like people. People act in immersive shows in the way that they wouldn't act in any other environment. Yeah. These people wouldn't come into our office and take <laughs> no. stuff. No. But, but in that show, but the, the people, people took, people potatoes. stole potatoes. Potatoes. <laughs> yeah. From the kitchen. People stole potatoes, and, and like these are people. A, you, they would never normally steal them. B, no. like if you want to, like if you want a potato, I'll give you a potato. <laughs> but why are you? It, it, people just go crazy in these shows sometimes. <laughs> like, what are you stealing a potato for? Who it wins? Is, it, is the, <laughs> it is that kind of thing of leaving the inhibitions at the door yeah. a little bit. That does happen in immersive mm-hmm. theatre. And that happened with ours, but also, as we were going back to a little bit earlier, the diversity. We did have a real theatre audience, but then we also had a kind of the secret cinema type audience and, yeah. and punch drug audience. We did have a younger audience, an older audience. We had a real diversity. And we had a lot of hen nights, which I never <laughs> wow, thought... Wow, okay, yeah. I would never have thought that. I never, which was a real surprise for me. <laughs> Only on Saturday night, so they, they were kind of a little bit crazy. they were crazy. They were crazy, wow. that was a bit of an eye opener. But on a Wednesday, it was very theatre audience and on Saturday, it was very party. Could, uh, another thing that we were, you know, particularly, that was a big thing for us was keeping the ticket prices down, you know, yes. which, which, and it wasn't, you know... A show with forty actors and that kind of level. That's just the actors, the crew was, as well. Was very, very difficult. But again, it was important for us for it to be accessible for, you know, whoever wanted to see it. And so that, and I think that was reflected in our in the diversity of our audience, which mm. is something we're very proud of. Um, so yeah. where do you begin? Do you begin with writing a script and then kind of work from there? Is that how you did it with Alice, or did you begin with the design? It's the idea, really. I mean, that sounds really yeah. cliche, but... but um, and I, every show is different. Yeah. Really. Like, some of them have been... I've gone and written a script, and then we go this way. But also, and some of them have... I not. think, also thinking about the shows, all of our shows <clears throat> in, in, in order, uh, they kind of are a, a reaction of the last show. Mm-hmm. So... Uh, the trench, for example, first world war drama that's probably a bit heavy subject matter, that came off the back of doing something really light and, and comedic, maybe. And mm. the same with the infant, which is quite dark. That came after immaculate. Immaculate's a broad comedy. Yeah. The infant isn't so. It, it's that of like, but that's not a conscious decision of like, oh, we did this now. Let's do this. What do we want to do now? It's what, what we want to do fun, now. What would be fun? What would be cool? What would yeah. be exciting? That's where it always starts. And I remember, I remember sitting in a park in, in and it sounds very glamorous in Gothenburg it, it, with Ollie and, and Tom, and and them talking about let's do a musical next, and thinking, oh god, I, I don't really know that much <laughs> about musicals, but we, and, and Tom and, and Tom's much more musically. He's, Minded but we've never known anything about anything until we've done it. We like we, like people think of us as a puppetry it. company. We, we'd yeah. never done. We'd never picked up a puppet before Terrible Infants, and we'd mm. never had mu- we'd never had live music in our shows before Terrible Infants. No. But we were just like, oh, that's cool. Let's do that. And so we've made some puppets and we've played around with them, and then we've got some instruments. And sometimes and it comes off the back of seeing something ourselves and going, "That was great," but wouldn't it be even? better <laughs> if we added this this and this we may fail at doing that but you know it, it's it's being inspired by seeing stuff uh, and not just repeating that because we, that's that's an interest but, us, but, but, but know, like being inspired by yeah it, by inspired say, by all theatre is theft is well, my yeah. drama teacher used to absolutely tell. my mm. whole career is based on um the fact that i saw quizula by four cents <laughs> and um I was so frustrated because I wanted to play as well and I just thought why isn't there stuff mm. that I can play as well and that's then when I actually started going to see other work when I started my PhD and started looking for this work yeah. where I could play too and then realised there was a few people doing <coughs> bits and bobs here and it's just kind of exploded so I was going to ask you why do you think there is this current kind of real appetite for audiences 
to participate in this way, to kind of get up out of their velvet, velvet seats. <laughs> I think Ollie said it, uh, well, you said it earlier, really, uh, is that there is a demand out there for, for something new. And that just mm. as happens with theatre, but with film, um, you know, with the advent of like 4D and things like that, of, of like 3D films or 4D films that's happening to you, the, there is an appetite for taking your experience a little bit beyond mm. what's happened already. And music as well, whatever, any, any art form, people are looking for the next thing. There's also a kind of a bit of a cultural shift at the moment. In, and I think it's a generational thing slightly about audiences f- feeling a, wanting to be a part of a story as opposed to just see a story you know and that's happening you know across everything from like we talked about computer games earlier but you know it, you know there's so many things where you get to kind of be part of something yourself, and I think that's something that people are, are, are craving and, and 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 looking for more. And 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 the idea of something that everything is, you know, we're, again we're coming out of a time where you, you know every television show or, or song or everything can be ripped and copied and reproduced and and you know just yeah. picked up at, at a moment's notice. So what I think is really shining through at the moment is is the desire for an individual, unique experience that is, will, can never be repeated. You have, you know, when you go to Alice, you, you have your experience and that is never, you know, that will never be repeated, that moment in time. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that's something that people are very, you know, looking for at the moment, is that sense of, this moment is happening now and it and then it's gone. And it's like it's about liveness, isn't yeah. it? It's really become about liveness because as you said, everything else can be copied mm-hmm. or replicated or you can have it. Yeah. And I think this resists that kind of commodification yeah. in that way. Which yeah, I think yeah, yeah. people really like the idea that it's something that's unique and something that belongs to them yeah. and them only, which yeah. I think is probably one of the things that I really love about it as well. So I was going to, um, you've already said it's coming back in April and, um, next year and I'm sure lots of people are quite excited, people who didn't get to go, I know lots of my students are desperate <laughs> to see the show, it's too late for their essays though, <laughs> which they're upset about. Um, <clears throat> what, is anything going to significantly, oh, actually you can't tell me too much probably, but is anything going to significantly change? I think the big thing is going to be that those, the different paths are probably going to be even more pronounced. The different okay. suits are going to have an even more specific journey I think That's gonna I guess there's two thing. things first of all there's there's things that we want to change and that whenever you do a show and, and you and you, you, you want to bring it back because you feel exciting and, and want to do it and as Ollie said that but the second thing is that uh, there's, be, there's a few changes in the vaults uh, structurally and architecturally and that's a good thing because yeah. that has made us uh, think about how we can do things differently and use different spaces differently so that will be different as well it has mm-hmm. to be but that makes it more, you know different from what came before and make, pushes us which is what it's all about yeah stuff that you know again with a show like that it's such a beast that once it's up and running it's very hard to make any significant changes yeah well, well, I mean well, we did <laughs> but we did. there are certain things First that now years. now you've taken it down and you're going to be putting back up again you can really go you know what, we never quite mm. got that the way we wanted it, so now we can re- revisit but it, that. But it's, it's interesting, going back to my, the second point of what I was saying about things that are changing structurally in, in the vaults. Since Alice, and it's been you know, quite successful, which is great, we, we've been asked and we've been looking into the uh, possibilities of taking it to other places. Yeah. Uh, so there's been interest in China, which is exciting, and Dubai, yeah, and, and, and New York, and all these places. And you think, well, actually... What building do you want it in? And putting it in a different building totally changes the show. Yeah. Um, that show was designed around uh, you know the complexities and the architecture of that building. So when it changes, the show changes. Um, I think this is a real challenge actually for this art form, and actually one of the things that makes it really challenging to take to festivals as well is that mm. most immersive things are so reliant upon that site specificity, yeah. and so shifting them or moving them around is really difficult. But I know there's a huge hub in New York of this mm. kind of mm. work in Manhattan. So, but again, the shows that are there have been resident for five or six years yeah. in the site that they began their work in. So, is that going to be a challenge? Do you think in the future is kind of I think you just have to, sort of, you have to embrace do it. a new, you know, you have to yeah. be prepared to adapt it to, you know, you, it, it, when the space is part of the show, is a character in the show, you have mm. to be prepared to, it's like auditioning a new actor, you can't just, you, you're not just going to get a carbon copy, you need to go, okay, right, how's this going to work with you mm. and with us and yeah. together? 
And um, you mentioned that you're starting to develop, because I was going to ask you if Immersion is going to potentially become something that the company uh, explore even further, because as far as I'm aware, correct me if I'm wrong, Alice was your first kind of immersive mm. yeah. piece, yeah. but you did say you were starting to develop another immersive we've got piece. A, we've got a big immersive show that's going to be opening in July, which I'm not allowed to tell you about, and everyone tells me <laughs> we're, we're, start talking about it. But we're, we're allowed to tell you. We're allowed to talk about what it. What I can tell you about it is that it's going to be, we're collaborating with Madame Two Swords. Ooh. Are you allowed to say that? I'm not. No, you're not allowed to say that. No, 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 no. Are we allowed to say that? Yeah. No. <laughs> <that's> <laughs> the only the saying no. The casting call's going out. The casting call's going out this week, and our name is on it. And Madame Tussauds' name is on it. Well, I'm not launching this till I've just finished the website and everything, and I'm launching it end of April. Oh, but they're fine. So I'm buy that, buy that. I've already got two others I'll to come t- up I'll, first, ta- I'll, 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 I'll take the flak. Just let me know. Um, but anyway, so we're doing an immersive show. We're collaborating with um, with somebody with Madame Two Swords. <laughs> it's the other thing that I'm not allowed to say. I don't know. I don't, I'm taking. It. I'm so. doing it. I'm doing it. Oh, <laughs> we're, well, we're not allowed to say. What we're, well, I know. We definitely. So, we're not allowed to say. That we're not allowed. We're to say collaborating that with Madame Two Swords to create an experience for Madame Two Swords in Baker Street, but um, we. So that, that, that experience will be there during the day, but then in the evening, we will be creating a show within that set. Ah, so okay, there'll be so, okay. which is a really interesting combination for us yes. is, is, is of using resources to create this kind of experiential thing for them during the day, and then in the evening, go right now we can use that set. And we're going to create a full show, and that show will be opening in June, July, um, yeah. and those tickets yeah. are going to be going on sale. Fairly soon, actually. Uh, uh, so probably even by yeah. the time you announce this, it might be That's official. becoming actually a real issue as a researcher because I try and go and see pretty much anything that is immersive mm. everywhere. And um, I didn't get to see you me bum bum train show <laughs> because I just could not get tickets. Mm. And that actually is becoming a real issue is being able to... There's it's such it. public demand. Trying yeah. to get tickets for things is... You have to really be in the well, know. Well, this is going to be a really... You know, again, it's another one where it's really hard to know how this is getting so it's a of real course. brand new me- mechanic but it's, it's quick again. off the back of the yeah. uh, the awards as well yeah. so I think it's it's probably going to sell out fairly and it's charged. limited it's 40 audience per show wow okay and only 8 weeks and it's only on break weeks Wow. So keep your so eyes open on our website eyes. and um, uh, yeah and then we're doing another one at the end of the year that's also limited uh, are we allowed to talk about that? no why? <laughs> We're not allowed to talk about that, no. So much secrecy. But, but I know, it's ridiculous. We are allowed to talk about that. We're not allowed that, to talk about that one. We're doing another immersive, we're doing another immersive show yeah. in the vaults again. Yes, Ooh. but we're not allowed to say in what October, it is. In October, September, October. This is good for me, it means I can keep my eye open. Yeah. <laughs> and this, again, is another new uh, development. It's another different type of uh, immersive you know, we're collaborating with some very, very exciting people. <laughs> I can't, I can't really I'm so that. excited now. I know um, the people listening that, to this are going to be That will be well. announced if it, in a If it was up to us, we'd tell you everything. We really, yeah. I'd be like, yeah, sure. but it's other people that like. So that will be opening in September, October, and that's going to be with some very, very, very exciting collaborations mm-hmm. on that. And Great. that will be running for about eight weeks Again, as well. Again, a limited. Yeah. Well, that will be limited. That's 80 people per show. Maybe, maybe less. Super. Wow. Okay. That's really cool. So it's, I need to keep my eyes really peeled yes. for that. And then also <laughs> we've got uh, Menagerie. Imagine Menagerie's on tour, but there's yes. a follow-up. A brand. We've got a brand new outdoor show, which I am allowed to talk about, <laughs> which is called Doctor Latitude. No, the Fantastical Flying Exploratory Laboratory, Excellent. which is set on a high. Yeah, you know, this tells you about our artistic policy. So we were we were doing this show, Imagine Menagerie, which is in this horse box, it's a pop up mm-hmm. goes through the festival. I saw the set like, when, oh. I, when I spoke to Alice. It's totally bonkers. Jane. The set was, looked amazing, it looked great. So basically we were like, oh let's do another outdoor show, what should we do? And there was like, should we do one on a hot air balloon? Yeah. Actually, yeah, actually, yeah that's that's actually, actually, did you it. see the show? You didn't, you I, didn't, did, I couldn't right. get to see Cause it. That's, yeah, because we did start that show as an outdoor show, uh, oh. touring with this horse box, and then that proved quite popular so yeah, we converted it, quite it. Compact. yeah we converted it to an indoor show which ah. is what we're touring at the moment well it finishes on Sunday which is uh-huh. where you met uh, James Kenny Girl and Alice Bounce yes yeah because yeah, I got to keep seeing the set because right. um our university building is attached is actually part of the new theatre royal right. so I have to go through uh to get coffee and I like to do that because I get to see all the sets being built mm. and stuff and that set with us like that's just bonkers that's designed by Sam yeah. as well so our new our new one is set in a basically a giant hot air balloon oh, that's wow. going to be suspended 10 metres above that's touring festivals 
this summer, which is going to be absolutely bonkers. Great. Um, and awesome. we've got, we're bringing back the Board of Villains, which we're really excited about, mm -hmm. which is going to be coming to the Spiegel tent in Edinburgh. And then Summit Playhouse in September, which we're very excited about. We can't wait to get back into an actual <laughs> theatre. We can point all the lights in one direction. Yeah. yeah. That's really exciting. You're so busy. When do you guys actually get time to sleep? Mm. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. No. We're doing a kids show as well. Oh, yeah. yeah. That's what we were just having a meeting about. The sequel to, up with our kids company, Le Petit, we're doing Captain Flynn and the Pirate Dinosaurs 2. Oh. And we're doing another one at Christmas, we which I'm not allowed to talk about that one no, either. Probably no. not. <laughs> um, but that's going to be very fun. That's that's based on a very exciting book, and that's going to be opening in Worthing at Christmas. Well, the final thing I wanted to ask you about, again, just because it's something that um, I'm really interested in and I've really had struggles with myself, is documentation. Documentation becomes so important for your legacy, mm -hmm. for the heritage of the kind of the work, and specifically with immersive, it's so hard to document it in a kind of meaningful way. So have you managed any strategies for documenting I mean, like, the work itself and people's experiences of it? Well, actually, funny you should say that. We do have, there is, an, there is a, there will be analysis, Adventures Underground book, photo book. Um, we didn't know that. High end we didn't know table, that. But we were well, it's not out yet. This is a ah. pro, you're, yeah, you're holding you're a prototype. first person in the world, well, not the first person in the world, first First outsider from the office to see this. Just for everybody listening, you're going to be so jealous. This is stunning. It's really beautiful. So we were very, very lucky that um, we collaborated on the poster with a very, very um, talented photographer. And um, over the process of the show, he came back and he documented everything. And so we, now he's putting great, together yeah. this beautiful book of his of his pictures of the show um and so that's really exciting that's mm. going to be hopefully done in time for the, oh, for the new show into my university library <laughs> <laughs> but then also you know there's we we do elements of trying to capture it for on film a little bit but mm -hmm. it, it's so it's, yeah. it's one of those things it's exactly what we're talking about and that's probably the moment that you manage to capture it We'll need to find something else to do. Absolutely, yes, it's impossible to capture. Yeah. It's really impossible. Also, what's quite good is is um, you mentioned a little bit of collaborating with people, different types of people that aren't involved in theatre, mm. uh, which we did with this company who called Creature, who, who collaborated a little bit with Alice. But the reason I'm talking about it is with Alexander Wolf with Trench, um, and he did a lot of. Uh, he'd never been on stage before as an actor. He's a musician, singer songwriter, mm -hmm. and he performed in Trench and performed all these songs and and documenting it he was uh, he wrote the music for the Mock Turtle and he performed as the Mock Turtle so he released that as a, as a single and, yeah. and, and that's out there and, and, yeah. and the, you know people can buy that and listen to that and that straight away brings back memories of that so there's a yes. kind of documentation with his involvement I mean he, uh, which was exciting mm. um, which adds another level to it I think it's objects because for me as a researcher as well it's really challenging to especially the ones that are super secret so there's no documentation mm. of some shows mm. at all there's yeah. no photos there's no footage there's nothing and if you couldn't get a ticket to go my I guess my concern as an audience member, I kind of like that because I like the fact that I've, I've got my card and it yeah. brings mm. things back for me. But as a researcher, I kind of go, damn, how do I write about this and how do I disseminate yeah. this? Yeah, and how yeah, do I yeah. capture this as a cultural we, moment? Yeah. <laughs> we yeah, talked yeah, yeah. a lot about how much we should give away mm. before the show. And uh, it was a real, you know, it, it was difficult because, uh, you know, we didn't want to give too much away. No. Because of obviously, you know, we had a lot of tickets to sell, but yeah. also we wanted it to be special. Like, the, I think the only true way to experience Wonderland is to go there yourself. I think yeah, we put absolutely. that as a tagline. So we didn't want to give too much away, but then suddenly when you've got the BBC ringing you, BBC News or Sky News saying, oh, we'd love to come down and film a bit, film it was all right. like, oh, mm. what should we do? What should we, yeah. you know, because we've got a lot of tickets to sell. But so I think when those things happen, we, we let them film a little bit, not all yeah. of it. And, and so we gave little bits away yeah. but it's interesting now we're we're coming back in April everything's out there and now we've released a lot more there's yeah. loads more images so now we can yeah. be a so, bit more open about it yeah. which is nice yeah. and, but also it's you know the fact that we were nominated for Olivia is this now we're it's, part of it's part of theatre history now yeah no absolutely that <laughs> we're on a list documented. we're on a list on a website somewhere <laughs> that and this it, show it, happened it's always that tension and for me um, 
I always have that tension because as an audience member, as someone who loves this kind of work, I like that, mm. that kind of non-disclosure of stuff and that secrecy. Mm. But as a researcher, I find it challenging and I worry for in 20 years' time. Yeah. The, the, the very thing that makes the form so exciting mm. and so experiential is potentially the thing that's going to mean yeah, I know exactly what it will mean. be lost. And live art has had this trouble all along. Mm. What you've got are a few pictures and it's actually the things, and this is what scares me, it's the things with the pictures the iconic images from that live art that have survived yeah. kind of through that has cultural legacy mm. and has cultural value and all of those other things that didn't capture those things in the moment ha will be lost and have been lost to the memory and I guess yeah as a researcher I care about that but as a practitioner does that do you worry about the legacy of that work I think, I think that's a care? really no, I think that's a really really interesting point and I think often the people, you know, not necessarily talking about ourselves, but often the people that are doing the most interesting and most experimental work aren't the best documenters. Aren't no, the people that no, take the time to go, let's, you know, let's make sure this is documented in the correct way. You know, like we've, you know, when you're in the middle of it, that's not what you're thinking. No, of course not. You're just we, we could going to make, make this work. And, really. You know, we have done over the years, there's, you know, things and events that we've done that you just go, oh yeah, we... <laughs> there was no point in our head we were going, we should probably book a photographer and do this no. thing. But, you know, we've done these one-off events or three-day events that, that have been these incredible experiences mm -hmm. and then you just, you walk away the next day and it's and they've disappeared. Yeah, and that's exciting about And it is exciting, form. yeah. But, it's, but it is that sense of also going, you know, you want to, you do, it is important to kind of be measured in, in, in a sense of cultural impact and yeah. it's massive at the moment. All of these things are such a, yeah. it, it, you know, to, you flick through the Olivier programme and you go, I would argue that's not really a representation of what theatre in this country is at the moment. No, not at all. You know, in the sense of the, the forefront of the medium and it's not, not detracting from those shows in any way. And it's not even thoughtless, I have the same, I have to think about it more because I am a practices researcher so when I do practices research it's one of the things that is always in the forefront of my mind because I'm terrible for it as well because I'm a practitioner first and foremost so I'm kind of in the studio doing all this stuff and it's usually driven by the, the research questions then sometimes after a couple of weeks I'll be like oh I haven't been documenting this or I haven't been documenting yeah. that and there is this real pressure especially in academia to have that disseminable evidence afterwards yeah. but it really flies in the face of what you do as a maker and as a practitioner it's, uh, yeah and we've it's you know we, it's, we, really we, it's, it's a real skill that we've had to try and learn and also to find the resources to do yes. because mm. you know like certainly in the early days you, you you're, you're, you're work, you work everything is going into making <clears throat> making it making it and absolutely. it's not it, you know you're not thinking about the other stuff um, but but again it, I think one of the reasons why it is important is because it, it's about the the next set of people that are coming through and yeah, they're the people that need to you know you, to you're standing on other people's shoulders the whole time and you need to go you know, people need to take what we've done and learn from us and build on that, and then the people after them need to be able to build on that. And you need, it needs to be a progression as opposed to kind of. It's become more acute with me thinking about with starting to teach it and going, oh gosh, where are the resources here to show these students mm. what immersive <laughs> work mm. is? And of course, there's some companies who are excellent at doing it because they have people that specifically mm. yeah. uh, document their work in that way. But the students are always like, we can't afford to go and see all these massive shows. How do we access yeah. these things that's not accessible to them? So. I have that in the back of my mind all the time, but I've started using um, a dramaturg mm. because initially I just got people like students and stuff like, can you please take photos? Can you please make notes mm. or whatever? But what actually what I found is you need someone who's much more embedded in mm. understanding your process mm. and understanding what it is that you're doing to be able to find ways to capture yeah. those yeah, things yeah, as yeah. you go along. But it is difficult because it's like a whole different discipline in itself that you kind of have to think yeah. about. But it will eventually become significant, mm. I think, because of that cultural. Yeah impact and of course having to prove impact to get funding and yes. things like that as well that, well, that was probably one of the big things that made a big change for us was when we started having to you know you know because again like as we said originally we didn't we were formed through just doing it like going, yeah. we need this we need you know like like james said immaculate we didn't have a set designer <laughs> we didn't have a yeah. you know a lighting designer we were just like <clears> okay <throat> can Right, light that bit up and light that, <laughs> make that bit dark, and you know. But that's that was our process, and I think one one thing that we could do better in this country is support 
those types of people. We've got we've got lots of young writer courses, we've got lots of young director courses, we've got lots of but you don't have any support for companies or for practitioners or for people that just make stuff. I agree. You know, it, it, we're kind of the way that we support and fund young talent is is to separate it from the people that they work with a lot of the time. Um, and actually what we need to do is, you know, you find young companies that are brilliant young companies that work together, we need to find a way of helping them to continue to work together and support them as a, as a, as a yeah. unit as opposed to going, right, okay, well, let's take the writer out and put them on a course and let's take the director out yeah. and give them a bursary. And I think, I think there are, you know, without getting onto a seven-hour discussion, which is what it would be, <laughs> about the Arts Council, mm. you know, the, 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 <laughs> Yeah, don't get me started on the Arts Council, but the, the, you know, the Arts Council are, the positives of them is they are one of the people who are there that can help yes. a company, uh, yeah. and we've been funded by the Arts Council quite a lot. Yeah, they've been fantastic. They have been yeah. great. Um, and so they are an organisation that, that can help, you know, like, a, like an organisation like we were at the beginning, but still, you know, th- that organisation, we, like, we didn't get Arts Council funding as the first time we ever applied because no, we didn't know what yeah, we were doing no idea well actually we teach it now it's one of the very first brilliant because our third years have to form a company and That's part brilliant. of their training for that is we teach them how to get funds raise funds and yeah. how to make arts right. council applications. applications because our course is about contemporary performance we only teach contemporary performance of course a big part of that is they devise yeah. they're, they're devising companies which means again mm. they don't want to go on writers programs they don't want to go on directors programs they want funding as a company so yeah. we can start to teach well it's them a big thing that we're doing like we've got the Les Enfants award which we yeah. which we award to kind of, and, and again the whole process of that was thinking about when we started and tried to I, mean, I remember trying to apply for arts council funding and I literally had no idea what I was doing and it was going what I needed, what I could do is if you go, right, here's what I want to do, here's why I want to do it, yeah. and let me show you. And so our process is built around that. You go, we, you send us in a three minute video, you tell us who you are, what yeah. you want to do, and why you want to do it, and then we have a showcase, and you do 10 minutes of the show, and then we pick a winner. And then we give that winner, um, we give them a thousand pounds of our own money. We get them a slot, the Pleasance in Edinburgh, and we get them up to Edinburgh, and we mentor them. Yes, I was reading about it on And it's basically going, well, what, what, did, what did I need when I started? I needed somewhere to do a show, yeah. I needed some money, and I needed some advice. Yeah. And so that's what we try and offer. And actually, what we're really that's excited great. about now is we're, um, we're starting with a new award, which I'm allowed to talk about because it's only us and I can only get in trouble with us. But we're, we're launching, we're going to be launching a new award um, called the Step Ladder Award, which is essentially the next step after that. Okay. And that is going to be to try and find young companies that are creating work. And the plan for that will be the winner of that, we will help them book a tour, we will mentor them, we will get a London showcase for them. So it's mm-hmm. this step up from what you've done, you know, because that was the next stage for us. We were doing Edinburgh, and we were being very successful in Edinburgh, and then we were like, well, how do we make this a thing? Yeah. And you need to, you know, we need to tour, we need to do shows in London, we need to build our profile. So the, the, that's an award we're just trying to figure out and put together now, and, you know, again, to encourage young theatre companies and, and help them Definitely get Definitely be telling get up. students about that then. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so... Thank you very much for talking to me. So my listeners and me need to keep our eye open for July for something yep. potentially exciting and our eye open in October as yep. well for something else exciting. Madame Tussauds, July, The Vaults, October. September, October. And then, of course, Alice is coming back. Alice is coming April. back. And that's going to be going on sale in about a month or so, I think. I believe wow, so. Okay. Yeah, yeah, pretty Ooh. early. Uh, right, maybe six weeks' out. time. Yeah. So, yeah, that's all our immersive stuff. But, of course... Our theatre stuff as yes, well, yeah, yeah which is course. the Border Villains. Border Villains Southwark. will be coming to Edinburgh and Southwark Playhouse, yeah. which will be lots of fun. Yes. And, um, and the Imaginary Menagerie is continuing. Imaginary still going on. Outdoor, and yeah. And then if yeah. you go to any festivals this year, you might see us. If you see a, if you see a giant horse box or a strange balloon-looking contraption, then it's, you. it's probably <laughs> us. Latitude, Glastonbury, yeah, those places. Yeah. And... Um, do you want to uh, talk about any of your Twitter or anything or plug any of those things? Yes, that's a good idea. We should do that, <laughs> shouldn't we? We are, uh, our Twitter is at Les Enfants Tur, um, T E R R. We couldn't fit the bubble. No. <laughs> um, I, obviously, Facebook is just Les Enfants Terribles, and then our website is www.lesenfantsterribles.co.uk. And you can find out most stuff on there. We announce 
you know, we announce all our kind of new projects and we announce castings and castings everything. Well, yeah. So that's um Where cool do you announce things. tickets first? Do you normally do them Facebook, Twitter or on the website Ooh. first? Facebook and Twitter. Yeah. Um, well hopefully yeah. all at the same time. Okay. But uh, or if you go onto our website and sign up to our mailing list, which you can go onto our website, click onto our mailing list and then you will get everything first. And if you go onto our mailing list you'll also get pre sale. Perfect. So we try and for every show that we do we try and offer like a 24-hour pre-sale to our mailing subscribers Fans. before <laughs> yeah, before they go in general sales. So good. Particularly um, like with the new shows good. coming up, which have got small audiences, they're probably quite good things. If you want, if you want to get in, then they're probably a good place to do it. <laughs> well, thank you so very much for talking to me. I know you're very very busy, so I really appreciate yeah, it. Awesome. I'm sure my thank listeners you. do as well. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you all so much for listening to the first episode of Talking About It Immersive Theatre. I hope that was interesting and entertaining for you. Uh, There's a few things I need to alert you to. Tate is going to be a monthly podcast and will be available from the first of every month from this point on. Now you can find us through several different avenues. We're on iTunes, SoundCloud and YouTube. So you can subscribe to those so that you don't miss out on anything. Um, Also, I would love to hear what you think about the podcast, so please do share your comments and your thoughts with me on those services. You can also find more information, news and updates via Twitter. Uh, Our Twitter handle is at Tate Podcast, which is T-A-I-T and then, you know, podcast. There's also even more information on my website, which is joannabucknell.co.uk. So next month, uh, the 1st of June, I'm going to be releasing episode two. In that, I'm going to be continuing my discussions with L'Enfance Terrible, but I'm going to be talking to two of the performers, Alice and James, and they were involved in Alice Underground. So I'm going to be talking to them about what it's like to be a performer in an immersive piece of theatre. So until the 1st of June, goodbye.